in Daba. Um, I'm going to talk today about the work of Sharp City. Sharp City is essentially a collective of young architects. Um, the work that I'm going to present is not my work. Um, it's the work of a group of people. It's the work of, well, um, my partners, Torsten Deckler and Anna Grapner, also architects in Johannesburg who run a separate practice. Myself, um, I'm a director of Paragon Architects, Hub Architects and Tectonica in Joburg. Um, and the work of Sharp City is then based on inputs from a lot of people, a lot of people who've contributed um, their work, their passion, aspects of what we do in exhibitions, photographs, writings, text, uh, maps, graphics, um, and energy and support. So it's, it's the work of many people. I, I just want to make that clear. Um, what I'm going to talk about is about attitudes and ideas about around practice of architecture because Sharp City is a particular form of practice of architecture. And um, I think what I'm going to say is, is my opinion because I'm giving the lecture. It's partly based on consensus we have in the group. I think the group is also diverse. We don't always agree on things, which is great. Um, Sharp City has become a business because we've been doing exhibitions for six years and it started becoming a really huge financial risk on our real businesses. So we formed Sharp City as an entity a year ago to separate it out from our businesses and see if it could stand on its own feet because the, yeah, just the exhibitions cost between half a million and a million bucks and you can't kind of do that as a sideline. Um, why do we do this work? We always get asked. I mean, we do, we do it out of passion and what, are, what I'm going to talk about is delivered with utter conviction and utter passion. And I'm lucky to have passionate partners. I think we are a lucky generation us who are alive and practicing, I'm just going to say us, um, because we have more opportunities than we can s shake a stick at. So the question is, where do you apply yourself? What do you do with your life force? Yes, you run businesses, you fill your fridge, but Sharp City is about, I think maybe covers aspects that we individually and in different ways as architects don't get out of our practices, because a practice like a relationship can only do so many things for you. It can't cover all the bases. So, Shop City is for us not an alternative to practice, but an add-on to practice. It's not like we should be doing only this and not running offices, or there's a conflict between what we do and uh, how we practice architecture in our, in our businesses and like the attitudes we have in this work. It's, it's an add-on. It's another outlet because there's only so much you can do. Everybody works in a certain sector of the market, and so there's certain things you can't get your rocks off on or certain interests you can't pursue if you just practice. Um, when you read uh, certain musical scores, there's a little um, thing in the bottom that says appassionata, which means it has to be delivered with passion. And passion is behind the work of Sharp City. I honestly believe, and I think since I started practicing architecture, it occurred to me very early that if you don't have genuine passion for what you do, what this field of endeavor and study and interest is, you're not going to make it. It's going to be much more, much more tough if you don't have passion about it. So, I believe it's fundamentally important to have passion, and passion means that you engage beyond just the obvious and that you just fervently start believing in things. So I, I hope that I can transmit some of the passion that we have for things, and those things start out in uh, Johannesburg, but I really want to call the lecture Architects and Karate, because um, we do architecture and then we do other things, and um, I've chosen my favorite photograph of architecture that I have in my life, um, which is actually in Namibia, not in South Africa, um, to just talk about the landscape. I want to start with landscape. The work of Sharp City started out with a, an intense interest in landscape. And by landscape, I mean not just the physical landscape, the social landscape, the economic landscape, the headspace, the psychological landscape, the post-apartheid landscape, the post-colonial landscape, the new South African landscape, the old South African landscape. Landscapes of the mind, we, we just as young practitioners got interested in the stuff that is around us. So um, there's a strong driver in our work about portraying things about landscape and telling stories about the South African landscape, landscape of cities and how architecture sits in it. Um, why have we called it Architects and Karate? You don't make it up all yourself. Um, this is somewhere on the East Rand in Joburg. So um, there are other architects who do karate as well. It's not just us. Um, I don't know why the door is bricked up there, but that's uh, another <laughs> argument altogether. Because maybe the combination is a bit obscure and it doesn't always work. 
But architecture and karate is about, is about, there's so much architecture you can do, and then you can get into completely other things, more maybe by accident, as was our case, or by bad attitude. Um, Sharp City is based in Joburg. The juice of it is a Joburg juice, okay? Like, we feed off the energy of the city. Our city is an amazing city. It sustains us. It nurtures us. It, it cooks. We, and and we, we found ourselves as young architects living in it and saw this tremendous, like, force of change around us and couldn't put our finger on it. Um, and we, we had to zone into where we are, like, actually anchor ourselves because as practitioners and inner land where we've been lucky to be busy producing buildings, we have found ourselves putting stuff out all the time, delivering, 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 and not feeding ourselves. Like once you leave Varsity, you, leave, you lose all this input that you get quite used to. So we started zooming in on Joburg and on the different cities that it represents. And this is just a, we, one of the projects we did was an early kind of spot research about the many names that Joburg has, and maybe that's a good starting point. Because the city that we come from, we obviously discovered, is many cities and many names. And one of the things about Sharp Cities maybe that we try to give things names in order to give them a presence and an identity and something to rub up against. Um, so I think, I think and, and, the, and the critical thing, I mean, for ourselves as well, we only know so much. We only knew so much. We all come from a certain cultural headspace that that restricts us in a way. In a, in a sense, our education probably makes us dysfunctional to participate in certain ways in our city. It does, because it has biases. It has to have biases. You can only package so much kind of broadness into a thing, and eventually you have to focus. And they, so your education only prepares you for so much. So when you start practicing, you end up with a big headache from time to time, because you feel yourself unable to understand what goes on around you. And it's, it's a critical problem. So. It can be a headache. Our work started out, we as young practitioners started having a headache about Joburg, about, about the way it was being portrayed, especially in the media. We started this work out in 95, 96, when Joburg was being talked dead. It was dying for specific reasons that go way back, probably 25 years. Um, but it, it was being talked dead, and it, and it made us immensely angry that we were trying to practice and build lives and careers and businesses in a city that there was growing consensus, especially in the media, that it wasn't worth pursuing. The city was to be given up. You should throw it away. You should dis discard it, disregard it, not bother about what was going on. Like, we'll fix it later. Um, but we love Joburg. I mean, we just do as people. So um, when you see this, it makes you angry and it gives you a headache. We started looking at this work shortly after the change to change over to democracy, the sort of formal part of the revolution we've lived through. And it started bothering us that the new values that arguably were enshrined in the new constitution, and the constitution to me is more interesting as, a, as the implied basis of a social contract between people and uh, people in a nation. And that means individuals between each other, um, people to the place that they live in, the question of citizenship in the wider sense that you that we now, have, we now have suddenly had this possibility to fully engage as active, fully valued members of society in society that implied arguably a new relationship to land and to the landscape, a new responsibility, and it applies to each one of us. And we sort of felt that the debates about Joburg and about architecture as well, that was marginal, were going in the wrong direction. They weren't dealing with the, this amazing implication that we had a new responsibility. And yes, I can go on to the, the implied responsibility between architects and clients, architects and society. I mean, we learn about these things at university, but you, know, you, you, you kind of instinctively know what's right. But how do you act it out, and where does it happen? Um, I think we, we are still going through a transition. We're going towards a time of unbelievable challenges for us as a nation, for us as people, as individuals, as practitioners, as citizens. And it worried us that like, things weren't being talked about that were quite obvious or that we thought we understood from, from having studied. Um, this is my um, second most favorite picture about architecture, about Joburg, which is about um, this immense energy of Joburg and the fact that as architects have had this very exploitative relationship to the landscape of Johannesburg. And so what we've done as a profession for 118, 119 years 
is we've cast these stylistic spin-offs into the felt. And so the pile of rubble grows and the city grows and people live in between. And architecture is kind of very visible but isn't, isn't necessarily tied into these relationships to the landscape. There's often a conflict between what gets produced and what should be produced. And so this picture to me embodies what Joburg architecture has always been about and continues to be about. And in a sense, cities have a spirit and part of our work's also based in, a, in, a, in our own cooked up developed belief about what we believe the spirit of Joburg to be because places have a spirit. There's no question about it. It's not even an argument. Cities have souls and or landscapes have souls and if you want to tune yourself into it you can suddenly find that the landscape the city that you live in incredibly nurturing so we were looking to define for ourselves a soul and this is part of this is one picture of a part of the soul of Joburg but this is the third favorite picture which is about the question of collecting these things because we're living through this immense period of change and we're not we're not holding on to it we're not archiving no we're so busy doing what we do that nobody stops to hold on to the stuff that moves through our fingers, like water, it just passes, 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 you're busy, you're busy, you interact, you do stuff, and the stuff's gone. So it's quite nice if somebody collect, collected the hubcaps, like, because they're a record of stuff that passes by, the things that go bump in the night. So part of Sharp City, I think the long-term thing, if it survives as a business and as, a, as an idea is, to build an archive because nobody's doing it. There is no archive of the built environment in South Africa other than dusty drawing collections and that's a crisis. It's, a, it's something we will regret as a, as a design community in the future because the stuff that we live through now, this amazingly privileged time with all these opportunities and all these challenges and all these choices will have, will have passed and it will fade. Um, there's poetry in the work and we talk to people. We're not interested in architecture as such, so we go around and we talk to people. We do spot surveys and people we found in our city tell us amazing things. It's not, nothing you could cook up in your head if you tried. Um, we discovered this amazing beauty of the landscape. We became passionately convinced about the fact that you could love this harsh landscape of Joburg because Joburg is not an obvious place. And once you, it's all about, well, it's about one part of it is like the glass is half full or the glass is half empty. That's like the headspace about life. The other thing is if you want to extract beauty out of a given situation and you want the place that you live to nurture you, you make it happen. If you feel it's not giving you anything, go after what it's got because you just have to uncover it. Most of us don't bother. Um, I just had to put this in. It was a quote we got. We didn't cook it up. I promise you. Okay. Um, but we like Cape Town, actually. It's great to be here. Um, there's, this, there's this amazing sense of, of well, we, we started looking at the obvious things. We started looking at our table mountains. We started looking at, at the, the beauty of it, the light quality of it, the way stuff grows, the way, uh, you know, the way people, animals live in this landscape, the kind of madness of it, the, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the falseness of it, the facadism of it, the way that architecture plays out ambitions that we may or may not like, but it's part of the story. So once we got into storytelling, like everything is part of the story. So you stop being judgmental and you put things on the plate and you write the story. If there were 40 people writing the story and there were 15 exhibitions of South African architecture a year, we could work in a very focused way and bring very particular agendas to play on what we do. But we can't. We kind of just about the only people who, who put stuff out there. So we have a certain implied ethical responsibility to kind of remain general and not bring our own axes with us and our chips on our shoulders that we do have. Um, and there's stuff around us that's highly questionable and you start interrogating it for yourself. You look at the ugliness and you look at the harshness of it and there's a, there's a kind of an edge to everything that you look at that, that can resonate, that can start to buzz if you, if you want to extract value and knowledge out of it. Um, but I've talked about the harshness. I mean, there's also just an incredible beauty. And it's, it's just a thing about the landscape starts to feed you. And it's been, I'd like to invite everybody to try it. It works. Um, kind of there are religious moments to it when you, when you begin to love what you do and how you unkey the landscape for yourself. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we trawl the edges of the city and we look at conditions and we, we 
we take things at face value. Um, and we look at the inventiveness of it, at the new interventions, at the experimentation of it, at the contrast of it. They're kind of obvious things, but it helps every now and then to actually focus on what you see and look at the surface and extract the full depth out of the surface. Um, and the city is like this amazing theater. I mean, you can become incredibly excited about it. Um, to get back to this thing about the different cities, we, um, they, so we work in the realization that we have only one reality and many people have many different realities about Joburg and about Cape Town, about any place. So um, we've, we've started getting really excited about these different things and it's a process of uncovering it and telling the story. So the work of Sharp City is storytelling. Um, Sharp City is now housed in an in a office in Fitas. Um, close to the inner city, um, the sort of fetus is the District 6 of uh, Joburg. Um, it started, so, so this is a, a range of projects and I'm just going to run through them and, and get to a concluding argument about, about something about design culture. And I think part of the frustration and the headache that I talked about was about uh, all of us have, in Sharp City have worked overseas and we've been lucky enough to see, to live in cities and work as architects in cities that have an alive design culture. And by that I mean not the quality of the buildings that are around you. Or, uh, I mean the fact that members of the public give a continental stuff about what you do. And that there's a, a weekly write-up in the newspaper about issues of the day, about the built environment. And it's simple things like that that South Africa doesn't have. And I firmly believe that that's why so much crap gets built around us. Because there's a hell of a lot of it. And I'm going to talk later about excellence and why, as an industry, and to be good to ourselves, we should celebrate the excellence we produce collectively and our friends and colleagues and, and, um, and competitors produce. Um, so we, we, we can all spend, and, and I think most architects in this room would probably at some stage of their life have complained about the absence of a of a critical culture. Like there's no sounding board out there. There's no mirror for the work you do. You kind of produce your stuff and you carry on and you do a bad building, you do a good building. It doesn't matter to anybody. You don't ever get people breathing down your neck about what you do. So we work in this vacuum and it makes our practice incredibly difficult and it certainly reduces the quality of the practice of what we do as architects, as practitioners. Um, so part of Sharp City is also, we can all wail for the rest of our life about the lack of this culture or we can start building it up. So we decided to build up kind of a context for ourselves because nobody else is going to make it. We better get busy building. A, 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 so design culture is about a supporting culture that gives a critical framework for what you do on a daily basis. Um, we, uh, Torsten and myself, took part in a competition for Japan Architect Magazine and it was a speculative competition um, that was about... Um, it was about, it had a simple brief, it was a one-pager competition, it was about how do you make attractive and beautiful cities anywhere in the world. So um, we uh, kind of sat down, we said, well, if we undo kind of the stuff we know and we take a really radical view about cities, what do, why do people live in cities? They live in cities in places because they interact. So we charted a number of interactions. We looked at a inverted map of Joburg, we just flipped it upside down and colored it up in a different way, and we sort of mapped a range of human desires onto the onto an abstract map of any place and we said actually great cities are about doing exactly what on earth you want right now in cool places in the landscape. Wouldn't that be great if cities were simply designed about doing kind of what you want in a cool landscape? Given that there's an implied social contract about respect between people or there should be. Um, so we won third prize surprisingly in this competition and we got quite bolshy and we uh, the Biennale in Venice in 2000 was um, was open up on the internet to, for the first time in its 90 year history because it's always been a very closed shop so, to submissions and Massimiliano Fuchs the curator kind of invited people to submit stuff so we did we were kind of had a good bottle of red wine and we wrote a very bad attitude text because we saw this theme of the Biennale and we decided well what do they in Venice know about the relationship between ethics and aesthetics if they haven't been to Joburg so um, we sent off this sort of well you ain't seen nothing yet and we ain't going to tell you until you invite us. So we got invited and we panicked. It was six weeks before the opening and you kind of, yeah, then you suddenly, as I say, you cock yourself. Um, so we in six weeks invented 
two projects. One was a question, one was an answer project. We simply said, okay, we have this attitude about the city. We're going to chart 18 prototypical landscapes of the city and we're just going to do them. We're going to ask questions about what we see. So we're going to take photos of the city, like the stuff that you see every day that sort of gets under your, not under your skin, like under your fingernail, where it kind of really jars. And we're going to just ask questions about it um, and put it out there. Questions about the relationship between ethics and aesthetics. Um, and we then did an answer project, which was a project we had in our practice, which was about craft in the city, and it was about ethical interactions around the making of things and how you conduct yourself as, a, as somebody facilitating making processes. I apologize for the quality of the photos on this. They, just, they were bad photos, and they didn't get better with scanning. Um, so on the left is sort of this question project, which was really a, a landscape project, and then this project about making things. And we simply put it out there. We stressed ourselves out. It was a huge mission. We lost a fortune of money. We didn't know that we could. Yeah, I mean, how do you fund these things? We just took our own money and did it. Um, it was great. It was, it's ecstatic. If you ever get a chance like this, go for it. It's, it's fantastic to go to Biennale. It's like a big architectural circus, and you can sit next to Richard Rogers in the pigeonhole, not at the dinner table. But we had a pigeonhole next to Richard Rogers. I thought I was very chuffed about that at the time. Our practice was only half a year old. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's that kind of fun side of it. And, and for the first time, you go out into international architectural culture, and you see that people like Richard Rogers, when they do book launches, have little, like, chicks in black cocktail dresses to like dress up the thing and they bring models and they bring groupies and like you, you suddenly realize how immensely powerful the media machine behind architecture is and how we ain't, we don't know nothing in this country about how to compete as architects in this sort of star circus. Whether or not we want to is another argument, but the fact is like it's amazing to go there and realize how high the stakes are in the global architectural game. So these are buy and buy things. I mean, you learn a lot, you bring it back, you look at South Africa, you cry even more about there's, been, there's no culture. I mean, it's, it's kind of, there's, there's, there's a whole other world out there in the way that architecture gets sold. And, and yes, there was this immense interest. Like, they invited us because they thought what we wrote to them in a badass text about Joburg was interesting. Um, you kind of recoiled and recovered from that, and about two years later were um, invited via, via, via the National Gallery in Cape Town and Wits University to um, represent, to curate an exhibition on Joburg at the Sao Paulo Biennale as one of seven world cities. Um, it's kind of quite weird. We were so interested in Joburg, but we never thought as Joburg of, as one of the seven great cities of the world. Just never occurred to us. So it's quite nice to get this prompt from the outside. Somebody else thinks that you live in one of the seven great cities of the world. And you kind of, geez, why didn't that ever occur to me? I mean, I, yeah, I was thinking, I think it's so great, but I never thought it was that great. So you kind of, we all undervalue, underestimate what we do, what the interest in our work is. I think as practitioners, as individuals, hell, I mean, one in seven world cities, and I've lived there all my life, and I didn't know. It's quite a mind blow. Um, so we went off to Sao Paulo to this amazing Oscar Niemeyer design pavilion. It's kind of, they send you these pictures and it's so yummy and you just want to be there. And you get really excited and then you go and ask for money and you don't get it. And uh, it all gets very sticky and you kind of half ruin your practice. And you cook up projects and you go to architects and you ask them for work and they don't send it to you because they don't understand the opportunity because they've never been there. And so... Anyway, it's very hectic, but it's basically like doing an exhibition is like doing a building at the other end of the world. So this is how we practice globally. This is our form of global practice. Um, like there's this amazing building that then transforms in three days. You go and see this exhibition. You design it like a building. There's like detail. There's like one in 100, one in 500, one in five, one in two. There's fighting with the contractors. There's getting the budget right. There's a deadline. There isn't practical completion. There's opening night. So, and like a day before you have nothing, okay? And there's not like practical completion where like the beading is loose. Like an exhibition is not finished till it's finished. So it's relentless. It's much worse than handing over a building. It's completely frightening because 24 hours before opening, you have nothing. And it's not because you're disorganized, but because they only give you two days to build it all. So you do all-nighters, just like at varsity, just like in the practice. You just do it at the other end of the world. Um, so it's, it's fantastic. So, I mean, these were models of the exhibition. So we, we, we decided that we wanted to, to create a landscape. It was this thing about you design exhibitions around the attention span, about like how much time are people going to give you in a building with 300 architectural exhibitions? They're going to give you about uh, 
15 seconds if you work it out on average, but actually they're going to might give you like five minutes, maybe. So like your communication, the whole story of Johannesburg, you're trying to, for the first time for an international audience, you're trying to pack into five minutes. It's quite a task. So why do we do exhibitions? What does it give us for our practice? It makes us better practitioners. You become an incredibly sharp communicator. Um, and there's a certain economy in that, which is quite nice. There's, a, there's an extreme minimalism, which I don't have in any of my normal work. It's like super minimalism, trying to describe like the major projects of Johannesburg in 300 words. It's like almost impossible. Anyway, um, we uh, worked with, we had overseas collaborators. We did a research project on Main Reef Road as the umbilical cord of Johannesburg. We got friends from Berlin to do it with us. We created a forest of images, this idea that if you just walk through the exhibition, it would be like taking a drive through Joburg for an hour. Like, what would you see? What would you remember? You would remember some landscape, some people, some faces, the bumper of a car, a sticker, a house, a thing, a bit of sky, and then you'd leave. So what would we want to leave behind? Not the architecture, but like a picture of Joburg, because, hell, people don't know the place that we come from, but it's one of the seven great cities. Um, we packed projects into it, current work, from the good, the bad, the ugly, the constitutional courts and the Monte Casinos of this world because they're part of the story. Um, the houses, the public buildings, the squares, the spaces, the Alex Renewal projects. Um, and it was, it was one story and we, we, we had videos on, on AIDS and on coffin, coffin makers in Soweto and on, and on Fashion Week and on stuff and music and Quieto and uh, idol show videos and kind of you try to paint a picture of the place because architecture is incredibly boring when you look at it in isolation and the Biennale has 60% non-architect visitors and so you owe it to some respect to the non-architect visitors to not just talk about architecture. We, ne we next went to the architecture center in Vienna. Um, Anna joined the Sharp City around about that time. Or in fact, during, no, during the Sa first Sao Paulo exhibition, she actually project managed it, put it together, and then she had a contact to the architecture center in Vienna. So we got invited. Well, the director of the architecture center in Vienna, who's kind of seen 90 cities in the world, came to Joburg for two days, and at the airport when he left, he said to us, this is the single most exciting city I've been to. So it was like, yeah, go boy, give us an exhibition. So he did. Um, so, um, yeah, we, yeah, you arrive in Vienna to build up your exhibition and there's kind of posters of it all over. It's really cool. I'd like to have that to happen in Joburg every now and then, just like, or in Cape Town. It would be cool if there were like Josie posters in Cape Town to invite you to a storytelling thing. So we took the, um, we took the exhibition. We had um, photo essay, for example, by Hugh Fraser, um, I mean, the, these exhibitions had a lot of collaborators. I mean, we, we relied on the material of, of others who have their own passion and their own interests and their own tools for accessing the city. And we put together a show called Constructing the Future, uh, which was kind of a, a densified version. It worked better, especially of the, of the Sao Paulo exhibition. Um, we built these sort of mind dump like walls with information on them. We had, we had um, kind of, well, landscape panoramas on the side. So what, what you do is you do your own research. You actually, because there's nothing out there, there's no books, there's no publications, there's a lot of people who have stuff. But if you wanted to find a film, if we put together an exhibition concept, we wanted to put up a film about the history of Joburg and its physical development, it doesn't exist. It's a crime, it's a shame, it's pathetic. So you make your own. Um, so we made um, our own sort of film. Film's a bit ambitious. It's sort of like an animated presentation. But hell, you do it for the first time. You commission cartographers to do it. So you find the money for that. It's exciting. It's like architecture. It's like project management. Um, we, uh, we interviewed people. We made, we made words resonate. We, we, we kind of wanted to bring out the spirit, the feel of other people, what they think about the city. It's not about our headspace. We, uh, yeah, we again created this, this, this walkthrough forest. We... This is, this is the main reef road project. I mean, it's, it, once you start telling the story, you're actually involved in myth building. Like, why, uh, um, uh, Torsten met these, uh, these architects from Arizona, Rick Joy and the crowd, and they kind of, uh, they took a trip to Namibia, and Torsten came back from the trip and sort of told me the story about how he sat at the kind of Fish River Canyon in Namibia and spoke to Rick Joy, and Rick Joy said to him, you know why the Grand Canyon is grand? Like, because this canyon, pretty grand. It's like somebody just started calling it grand. So then it was the Grand Canyon. So that's what you do. So how do you start believing? How do you start having a passionate belief that you have the grandest place? Well, just call it grand and start spreading the news and start finding it grand. Start actually believing 
like completely that it's the grandest canyon. And there you have it, the Grand Canyon. So the other Grand Canyon in Namibia will never be that grand. Just because people talk themselves into believing that was the grandest canyon. So they have it. We don't. So um, when you look at Main Reef Road, which is sort of the scruffiest part of Joburg and is actually the umbilical cord where Joburg happened, hell, it's like the Champs-Élysées. It should be. Why don't we think about it like as the Champs-Élysées? Because we shooting ourselves in the foot. Um, we sell ourselves short. We don't adequately believe in the amazing things that lie in the ground under our feet around us. And so, yes, you can research Main Reef Road, which is a really scruffy, ugly industrial strip with an incredibly, incredible beauty and harshness and a whole industrial uh, fervor and, and like expended life force of the city and its history. It's lying right there, and we kind of think it's a dirty strip. It's not. It's our umbilical cord. So that's the kind of thing we did. There's a picture of the animated history movie we did. This is, again, the, the, the photo essays, which was a sort of north to south cross sort of photographing of the different landscapes of Johannesburg um, by Hugh Fraser. We did, an, we did a project on AIDS, speculations about projects that can deal with the impact of AIDS in the in the city, I mean, it's radical. People got really upset, both in Sao Paulo and in Vienna, about the fact that you would go to an architectural exhibition and talk about AIDS, because this is an architectural exhibition. So I think our work is grounded in a certain reality and a certain sense of realism. You do press conferences, you do talk shows, whatever you want to call them. You do parties in courtyards with Budavos in Vienna, and you try and work with people from the embassy who don't always understand these things. But we got Budavos in Vienna. Um, so and then you and you kind of project some of some of the real stuff that your landscapes made of into other places. With Dagmar, who was our collaborator on the Main Reef Road project, we got an opening last year, March, to do an exhibition in Berlin in the Aedes East Gallery. And their take on Joburg is just this sort of fast forward. Dagmar is an individual who spending has spent ten years in Joburg, coming there every two years or so and kind of said, geez, this amazing thing. Look at the city that was so stuffed up and nobody believed in in nineteen ninety five. And now it's 2005, and it's done this complete swing around. And look how much less resources they've used than Berlin to do an urban renewal and to rebuild the center of town. So isn't this an amazing story? So we did the Fast Forward Johannesburg exhibition. Um, a Sharp City contributed a landscape project. It was sort of, we've always been interested in making this continuous horizon out of the vastness of the landscape. So you kind of you just have some fun. I mean, some of it's just graphic works, just stuff you've always wanted to do. Um, and, uh, and it was very much an exhibition about a certain refinement of architecture, like portraying buildings as really nice, yummy pieces of finished stuff. They had a great exhibition system. Um, and uh, yeah, the, you again, um, you, you portray a different story, just the background architecture more as, as finished product. Um, the openings are always amazing. I mean, like kind of 300 people crowd into the small gallery for an opening. Um, you cart models over there. Um, you, yeah, you just you just try and paint a picture. You tell a part of the story. This was a more architectural part of the story, and was all about the speed of change. The speed of change is one of the things of the soul of Joburg. So you make an exhibition just about that. The pace, this Im amazing way that Joburg chews up and spits out architecture. Um, then you get spin-offs. I mean, suddenly we got approached by the Durban City Council through the Institute of Architects to help them land a competitive bid for a conference because suddenly like somebody thinks that you're kind of doing city marketing whatever so suddenly you find yourself in a in a place where you where you do completely other things no more exhibitions these are conference bids so we started looking just to help formulate the idea around a conference bid at where Durban is what the hegemony of kind of knowledge and control of knowledge in architecture is and you discover that there's a uh, there hasn't ever been a, a conference in the Southern Hemisphere. Rio, uh, Rio de Janeiro, in this case, was speculative. It was one of the competing cities. So um, Joburg competing against Rio and Tokyo, how do you do that? I mean, all of us would really love to go to both Rio and Tokyo. Why do we rather go to Durban? So you zoom in on Durban. You start looking at where it sits in the world. You start distorting the world map. You start saying, hey, it doesn't actually sit on the Indian Ocean. It sits on the African Ocean, the longest continuous piece of coastline on the Indian Ocean is actually the African part uh, up there. So, hell, why is it called the Indian Ocean? It's a blooming African Ocean. So you just put yourself at the center of it. So can we change these things? Yes. Can you convince yourself that the Indian Ocean is the African Ocean? Of course we can. Africa owns much more of it. So, you know, so like, why should there be a conference in Africa? Because things are called, like, are given the wrong names, and maybe we should have a conference about changing that. 
Um, you look at the relationship of that city to the world, to all these other places. What are the parallels? What are the contrasts? You, uh, you, we started looking at how it sits as a, as a port, as an interface between a whole continent and a whole ocean, and um, managed to do supporting documentation to get the president of the institute to go to Ghana, and for the first time in the history of the Union of African Architects, get consensus around a decision to kind of back a bit, because there's never been a consensus decision about anything in the African Union of Architects. So, and we started looking at the city, at what it is, what it, what it does, how it projects itself, where it sits. Um, you look at the beauty of that, you look at the density of that, you look at the surface of that city. Um, and we ended up, ended up kind of investigating it very quickly at a surface level and coming up with a theme of multiplicity, which kind of is really cheesy and obvious, but it, the conference needed a theme. And on that theme, they almost got the bid. And they've been promised that they'll get it next time. So it's cool. So we invented a conference theme. It's great. It's better than architecture. We went to AfriBuild. We sort of, it's a commercial exhibition. So suddenly we have to market ourselves because now we've got employees and we can't, we don't have the next project. We've always worked on Invitation. So we went to AfriBuild to put ourselves out there as people with an attitude about the city. So we're promoting our city without support from the city government because they wouldn't kind of help us because they don't understand. Um, because the marketing and tourism manager of the Joburg cities personally told me that she thinks Joburg is ugly and she wouldn't understand why people would want to go there. So we have structural problems. You know? I think people like that shouldn't be in that position, but that's, that's what she said. So. Um, so we, we used some of the models from the Venice exhibition. We simply did a slideshow and we uh, found that Autodesk uh, Revit were quite interested in what we were doing. Oh, we made postcards as well because the postcards of Joburg that you get are really cheesy, so we made our own. Um, and we found a partner in Autodesk Revit to help us facilitate the exhibition in, in Sao Paulo that we were invited to last year, which was an exhibition about South Africa. And then you start looking at a, at a whole country and at the vastness of the landscape. And I want to get back to what I said in the beginning about landscape, now suddenly we had, a, we had an exhibition about the whole country, like the first one after the blank exhibition. So what is our obligation? We have an obligation to represent the work of all of us because well, we can put ourselves on a platform, but that wouldn't be great. It would be a bit nasty and somebody would probably not like it. So why do we do this? I mean, because it's an opportunity and it would be bad to throw it away. Um, so you take this incredible beauty of the landscape and you look at the harshness of it and you take a view on the total landscape of South Africa and you we started talking amongst ourselves about the the absence of architecture in the landscape it, about how South Africa is defined by no architecture as a whole landscape and looking at the intense islands of architecture that you get in it um, so and it brought us back to this love of whew, what a relief, like no architecture. And then when you search in this immense, amazing landscape for the few pieces of architecture, you can find aspects of stuff related to architecture which can, which can really get your rocks off um, like this. But um, there's this, this complete, like our cities are these intense islands of architecture and in between is this nothingness. So we started inviting architects to submit work. Um, these were the, so well, you say competing countries. It's competitive to do these exhibitions. You, again, you sketch design that we went on this idea of landscape and about could we find work that architects say themselves is inspired by the landscape. And amazingly enough, we got like 60 projects without trying too hard of architects who wanted to participate in this exhibition who claimed for themselves that their work was in one way or another in, it, impacted and inspired by the South African landscape. So. Uh, we designed an exhibition which was very simple. It's a country monograph. Um, we made a movie. We found an engineer who had three months of time who did a road movie of the country for us for 18 grand. I mean, it's amazing. So we have, a, I mean, there's incredible people out there. Like this guy gave us all this time. All we did is pay for his petrol and the tapes and like a bit of food. And like he made this movie for us. So it's like incredible. People are generous. We live in this country where people are incredibly generous with their skills. And so, yeah, then we had another kind of more all-nighters. This time we found contractors. We had friends from the previous exhibition who built the exhibitions for us. And we did a country monograph show about South Africa, and we told the story of broadly the last 10 years of architectural production, sort of post-democracy, but not under that theme. Just kind of this is the work that came out of the process of asking people to participate to come with us to Sao Paulo. 
The openings of the exhibitions are amazing. I mean, 8,000 people come to the opening of the Biennale. Is, there is no culturally, I mean, do we get 800 people in Cape Town to an opening of anything? Like, no, like, so why not? Um, so there's a, there's a problem, like how do we make this culture? You make it, you, you just start doing it. Why is there no architecture biennale in South Africa? Because nobody's doing it. I hope somebody in this room wants to do one. Um, so yeah, I mean the biennales are, are integrated into the popular culture and the popular imagination to the extent where they get written into the scripts of soapies, TV soapies. So that's why people go to the biennale because their soapy stars go and snog at the biennale. It's as easy as that. So. We can make this happen. I, I fervently believe that we can build this kind of supporting culture where, where what, we, what interests us and what we would like people to be interested in is interesting to them. Um, yeah, people storm into this building. It's insane. They, they rush into this building. They, they have it like a barrier and they cut the tape and people race into this show. That's the anticipation about the Sao Paulo Biennale. Again, this building filled in a completely different way from the last time. This was our exhibition. Um, about 20 architects flew out of the people who participated. So suddenly your, um, yeah, you suddenly find that your colleagues are colleagues. You actually have dinner with them. People you kind of, you, know, you think are your competitors in town because they bid for the same work. You can actually have dinner with them. You suddenly exchange stuff. So it was an amazingly positive experience. We wrote a, a long critical text about our take on the current South African landscape. We had the movie, we had a history floor projection project just projecting aspects of data of history because people know nothing about the place. A so part of the storytelling is about the history and how the settlement happened, how the political history happened. So you develop all of that stuff. Um, and we called, the, we called the exhibition Utopia Nowhere Close, which um, goes back to this this realization that I think as architects, and we need to give ourselves credit for what we do, I think the best, the better work that is being produced in this country and the best work that is being produced by our living generation of people, like the people in this room in this country, is, I honestly believe, qualitatively and in terms of its ambition mostly, a lot better than it used to be. The stakes are much higher in the new South Africa for what we do. And so there's this utopian ambition. The good projects have an almost utopian ambition. They try to do the impossible. Because there's so little architecture going around, so few opportunities for really amazing projects that the, the, the good projects with good clients, with, with the right things, the projects that don't get watered down, have this almost utopian ambition. And architects try very hard. And by any world standards, the good work of this country has incredibly high ambitions and gets pretty close. So, we don't ever get there because there are so many mitigating factors. I honestly believe that the worst mitigating factor is time because of 25 years of high interest rates. We build insanely fast and it stuffs up what we do, so we never get there. Um, money, banks control what happens. Um, and so time and money mitigate, for example, um, the landscapes that we've inherited mitigate against projects becoming what they can possibly be. But Utopia Nowhere Close is about um, sorry, this is a utopian place in Sao Paulo. It's the top of the Hotel Unique where you do the after party. Go there if you ever get there. Utopia Nowhere Close is about we try so hard. We never quite get there, but hell, there are some projects that are fantastic that where architects go way beyond what they really require to do by the task at hand, where we extend ourselves as an industry and we really, really honestly try our best and we produce works of excellence. We've published a book which will be launched today at 4 o'clock downstairs in the expo because we go to these exhibitions and there are no books. There's no book on contemporary South African architecture that you can pick up. So it's embarrassing to do any Biennale in Sao Paulo and to have to tell the curator of the exhibition that he can't buy a book because nobody's made one, so we made one. Um, so that we can undo this headache and that we can get away from the stupid debate about style that, that pervades what we talk about when we talk about what should be made. Because style is only, is only so much. Because our obsession with style gets us into uninteresting corners and the debate needs to be widened. And through our work, we've tried to widen the debate in South Africa. Because um, whether or not we like Monte Cassino, maybe some of us like this, but maybe some of us, do, some of us don't like it. So the surface debate gets us nowhere, and I'm calling for a widening of the debate around architecture, about around the principles, the ethical principles that underlie our constitution and the implied social contract in the country, 
And the other thing I'd like to ask us all to do is to be honest about the good work, to put the little architectural publicity that's out there. Don't write an article for a newspaper that slams another bad project. They out there. Write one about a project you love, because otherwise we're never going to start be believing in ourselves. This is the artfark lamp. The artfark is the first Afrikaans word in the English dictionary. This is a lamp made by, uh, made by Dirk Barman for a project. And it's about cultural confidence. It's a, it's a kind of a spin doctor word at the moment in South Africa. But how are we going to build cultural confidence if we don't honestly go back to what's lying right on our doorstep, the inspiration in the landscape, in this case the art fark, which literally lives under the ground, and make amazing things and make amazing buildings. And can we get to a point, can't we get to a point where we can simply say, you know what, this is an amazing chapel. This is an amazing health and community center or early learning center. This is an amazing tower. This is an amazing platform to enact ritual in the landscape and cleanse. Um, this is an amazing government building. This is an amazing museum in a rural landscape. Um, like, let's start doing it. Like, Australia 10 years ago wasn't on the global architectural map because nobody knew about it. Why do we all know the work of Glenn Merkett now? Because they bothered to tell us about it. So let's start talking about the great work that we all produce because it's out there. Hell, there's a lot of good work being produced, so why don't we just put it out there and tell the story and tell the story honestly of how difficult it is to deliver it because we all struggle. We know how difficult it is. So let's talk about that story. People want to be entertained. The next project for Sharp City is, in, is a competition. We, we're interested in public space. It's the next thing. We're interested in the absence of public space in the way that it's dying, the way it's being eroded. And together with Autodesk Revit, we've launched a competition, which is also being launched today, a design competition due date in September for the design of a mobile piece of urban architecture that will temporarily enliven spaces in South Africa and build public culture. It's just an idea. Autodesk wants to make it an annual competition. I'd like to ask everybody to look at it and enter it, because why shouldn't you? They're great prizes, and we, we just simply wrote the brief. There's a jury that we're not on, but we assisted Auto, Autodesk to write the brief. Autodesk want to push design excellence, and that's what we do. That's the next project. We are privileged to be able to make our own future, so let's take hold of it and build it for ourselves. Let's build the supporting culture that we need. Thank you. Enjoy your architecture. Thank you.